it is so wonderful to have you here on Creating Paradise. I'm very excited to be here. Can you tell me what your paradise is? Um, my paradise is motherhood. Um, I am constantly in paradise with my children mm -hmm. and it has given me so much joy. I love that. All Thank right, you. let's get into it. So, I, we're going to go back in time and have some questions for you regarding okay. your memories. Okay. Uh, I knew what unconditional love was when filling that blank. Um, I knew what unconditional love was. I have like a two part answer to that. Um, when my mother um, forgave me time after time after time mm -hmm. of disappointing her and um, she never judged me she never um, held my wrongs like against me. She showed me the love that God had for me and she um, never made me feel less than. And she always told me that um, I have greatness inside of me and that I'm gonna do great things and still tells me that to this day. So um, she definitely shows me unconditional love. And with saying that, that has trickled over to me, be, me being able to show my children unconditional love. Um, I have an 11-year-old, and she makes me so upset sometimes. <laughs> and what's her name? Elena. Elena. And, um, you know, even through those moments, I tell her, like, I love you, and there's nothing that you could ever do that's going to stop me from loving you, and I'm always going to support you, and I'm always going to be there for you, and there's nothing that she can do or say that's gonna change that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's like, I know mommy, I know. And I'm like, but I want her to really know that. Like even when she's disappointed herself, because we'll have those moments, um, I want her to know that I'm gonna be there for her. Yeah. And um, I think that a mother's love is unconditional. Mm -hmm. Mine for my children is truly unconditional. Yeah. And I'm glad that your mother's was to you yes. as well. Can you tell me about yourself and mm -hmm. some major markers in your life okay. up until um, your second pregnancy? Okay. Um, I think that I'm like an outgoing, fun-loving, like adventurous person, mm -hmm. but also like I have this other side where I'm like very detail-oriented and organized and a little bit of a perfectionist. I have to like let the adventurous side of me fly. Yeah. And I think I get scared sometimes yeah. of failure. But um, I'm my own worst critic. And I think that once I become more comfortable in um, failing, that it will make my life so much more freer. And I want that for myself. Yeah. I want to be freer. Um, I don't want to be like so uptight. And that's not to say like I'm not fun, but inside I'm like cold, so tight. And I want to feel that freedom of just giving myself grace mm -hmm. to make mistakes and because I'm not going to get it right and I don't have to beat myself up when I don't get it right. Is that what freedom means to you? Yes, actually. Um, to give myself grace mm -hmm. is freedom and um, just being gentle with myself and not criticizing yeah. myself because yeah. I could be critical so um, yeah. we're all living this life for the first time we're all yes. figuring it out as yes. we go there's no rule book or playbook right yeah okay, <laughs> okay. so childhood okay let's talk about childhood up until um, learning that you were pregnant with your son okay and what some moments that you were like the, these things made Narkisa okay so I had a beautiful childhood with a dark shadow over it. I know that sounds mm -hmm. so crazy, but um, we're going to get dark. So, <laughs> um, so yes, I am the only child and um, I was born in Mississippi mm -hmm. and I was raised in Georgia. Um, I can't, moved here when I was four years old. Um, my mom is the baby. And so I'm the baby cousin. My closest cousin is seven years older than me. So I was just like very alone as a child. Mm -hmm. um, I had like lots of friends, but I felt alone. Um, 
I was abused as a child by my stepfather, um, who is now in prison. Okay. Um, so I think that like carrying that dark secret around um, was very hard. And I think it shaped me to be like very independent. And um, I actually read recently, I, I'm reading this book called The Body Keeps Score. And I read recently that that's like a trauma response, like hyper independence, yeah. um, because I'm scared of rejection. And I and don't if want, I don't have to ask, mm -hmm. then I can't be rejected. And, or if I don't have to tell you a part of me, if I can hide that part of mm -hmm. me, then I don't have to worry about you rejecting that part of me. So what I've like um, found myself doing in relationships like platonic and romantic is hiding different parts of myself. And then um, out of fear of rejection, but like, how are you going to have a successful relationship if you're not right. vulnerable? Right. Like, it's impossible. But I relate to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be also personality. But um, but yeah, so I think that that kind of shaped who I am today. And but I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I have been through lots of therapy and I have a wonderful support system. So I know that like, whatever happened, it happened and it was not my fault and I survived it. And I think that that's also kind of like shaped who I am today mm -hmm. because I look at myself like I can get through anything. I can, if I made it through that, then I can make it through anything. And I think that that's part of what kept me going when I was in prison. Um, I was like, well, it has to turn out okay. Like there's no other option. Everything has to be okay. And I just kept reiterating that to myself, like this is gonna be okay. My baby's gonna be okay. He's gonna be safe. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna make it through this. Yeah. And um, it's that inner strength yeah. that really pulled me through. Yeah. What, um, what mindset did you had leading up to being sentenced to prison? Oh my gosh. I was like, I, I think I was numb. When I look back, um, I didn't really process it until months later. So I was, um, because I didn't think it was gonna happen, so I couldn't prepare myself for it. And I'm the type of person that needs to be prepared <laughs> for things <laughs> before they happen. Um, I usually weigh like all of the, the variables and the look at the potential outcomes, and I just didn't see that one coming, so. And when you say you didn't see that one coming, are you saying you didn't see yourself you didn't see yourself heading to prison? Yes, because my lawyer, I had a lawyer and he had kind of like assured me that I was going home. And mm -hmm. then on top of that, a couple of days before I was sentenced to prison, I found out I was pregnant. I had suspicion because I had been sick. I was incarcerated for like 58 days. Mm -hmm. So I had been sick. So I was like, oh my gosh, I could be pregnant. And then I got the confirmation. So I was already like kind of, um, didn't know how to feel about that. So my thought was like, oh my gosh, I have to get home. Right. Because I can't have a baby. Like that wasn't even a thought on my mind. And then I got sent to prison. So um, like analyzing it mm. afterwards, I realized that that was God's way of me bringing this child to this earth. Mm. Like that was divine. That was the way it was supposed to be. What would you have done if had you not gone to prison? I would have gotten an abortion. Mm. Like, um, without, a sh without a shadow of a doubt, like, that was my plan. But I was like, I can't have this baby. Like, first of all, it wasn't with someone that I wanted to have a baby with. Um, and then I felt shame. I felt a great sense of shame. Here I am, I'm 31 years old, and I'm having another child out of wedlock. This is unplanned. Um, like, I felt like it was selfish. Um, and Selfish of you to, to bring a child in the world when you didn't feel like you had the things to sustain that child. Yeah, I felt, exactly. I felt like um, I had one child already and I wanted to be married when I had another child and uh, it didn't happen that way. But of course, that's what happens when you have unprotected sex. <laughs> and I, as an adult, I knew better. And so I felt a great sense of shame. Um, great sense of shame and so I said well I have to cover this up hmm. I can't have this baby uh, I didn't you would even, have not even told your family no yeah I know I and I um 
you know, it's controversial. I don't want anyone to be offended by that, but that's just my truth. Um, but once again, I'm happy that it didn't work out the way I planned. Mm. Um, God had a greater plan for me and it worked out the way it was supposed to. Wow. And Emmanuel's here. And Emmanuel's here. And that's why I named him Emmanuel. Tell me about the meaning of that name. Um, Emmanuel is God is with us. Mm. So um, I wanted God to be with him all the days of his life. And so I wanted to prophesy over him before he was even born. And so um, I was like thinking about the, the names and I said, Emmanuel. At what point did you start to associate being pregnant and having a baby with paradise? Oh my gosh. Um, he was my friend. Mm -hmm. Like I talked to him, I prayed with him, I sang to him, I read to him. And in those moments when I felt lonely because I mean, I am pregnant and I am by myself in prison. Um, I found comfort in him. And mm -hmm. so we built this bond that was just like amazing. And so um, that was paradise in the midst of, you know, everything that was going on. He was like amazing. And especially like when he was growing and to feel his kicks and to learn his little personality because they have personality even in your womb. Wow. <laughs> so, um, I knew when he was hungry, I knew when he was upset, and um, it was just, that was true paradise, being able to bond with my son. Yeah, it's so interesting because with a lot of us, paradise would mean leaving a situation, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't like this situation, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna go to Jamaica. <laughs> yes. You know, that's our paradise. So right. for you saying, you know, you weren't able to physically escape mm -mm. and go somewhere else to mm -hmm. paradise. Yeah. What was it like to carry paradise while being in prison? Um, it was beautiful. Mm. It was beautiful and it was something that I've never experienced before and something that I always remember. And, and you know, I think that you, you said earlier, my mindset, what was my mindset like? And I think that initially I was so like, mm -hmm focused on prison being like the worst possible outcome. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to prison. This is terrible. This is like awful. And I think that when I got there, I realized that it could be so much worse. I could be mm -hmm. dead. I could be facing a life sentence. Mm -hmm. I could have no one to take my baby when I did finally get that situated. I could be in prison hungry or not getting adequate treatment. And I think that I had to have a shift in um, things that I needed to be grateful for. Wow. And so something that I started to do was write um, gratitude list. Mm -hmm. And that was able, that, that's part of the reason I was able to shift my perspective. And um, I just do started- Do you do that daily, the gratitude? Not or? as much as I should, but um, when I am feeling like kind of ungrateful and bratty and I have to remind myself that I have a lot to be thankful for. Like just having health and my children are healthy and I have food to eat. I don't have to worry about if I'm gonna eat today. Um, and I have clean clothes and I have soap and lotion and the basic necessities that right. a lot of people in America don't have. So um, yes, I have a lot to be thankful for. Can you tell me about your community while in prison and um, how they maybe played a part in making the pregnancy feel more like paradise? Absolutely, so I was with um, other pregnant women and we were all going through the same things. And um, Can you tell me more about that? So you all go to a particular facility? We, we go to Helms facility, which is um, a medical facility and we are there until we give birth and then we go to the hospital, then we're in the mm -hmm. hospital for three days with our baby and then we're transferred to another prison for non-pregnant women. Immediately after? Um, three days, 72 hours. And, the, and they're very serious about those 72 hours <laughs> um, because they only pay for us to be in the hospital for three days. And then, um, yes, so right after, yes, we go mm -hmm. to a place for, and we stay in, a, isolated area for the postpartum duration but mm -hmm. I was with four other women that I had like went through we all went through our whole pregnancy together and yeah. we gave birth 
like I, I gave birth on the 12th of November and another lady gave birth on the 6th of November, then another one on the 19th of November, and then another one on December the 2nd. So like we'd all been together our whole pregnancy. Yeah. So it was like very comforting to have these ladies that I'd been with yeah. who were going through very similar things. Um, yes. How did you prepare yourself for knowing that you were only going to get to spend three days with your son? Oh my gosh. Um, I had some tears. I had a lot of nights where I cried. Um, I just had to pray. I had to pray and I had to trust God. And I know that sounds so cliche, but when you are in a position where you don't have any power, that's all you can do. And I think that mm -hmm. that's something that I've learned is like mm -hmm. to release and to just mm -hmm. let it go. Like when, I don't know what your faith is, yeah. but when I tell you that that is how I made it through, I mean it. Like, um, when he says that he's carrying that weight, I, I don't have to carry it anymore. I can just let it go and release. So, um, yeah. Prayer and tears. Prayer and, and tears. <laughs> Releasing in both ways. Releasing, yes. yeah. Yes. Releasing and letting go and trusting that everything is going to be the way that it should be because I don't have any power, I can't control anything. It's one of the um, wow. worst feelings in the world. But when you do let go, it's freeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no bigger way to let go, I think, than to let your child go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, I cried like that when they did um, come and take him because I was about to be you know, transferred. Right. Oh my gosh. The officer who was escorting me was just like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Cause I mean, I was just a mess. I was just crying, crying, crying. And then I had a cesarean. Mm. So like, I can't, <laughs> it was just like trauma on top of trauma. Right. Um, but once again, I'm a survivor. And I think my life prior prepared me for all that I'm going through because a lot of people my mom is like I don't know how you made it through like I don't know and I'm like well when you don't have a choice you have two choices you either are going to make it through or you're not so I knew that I had to be here for my children yeah so I made it through yeah absolutely um how did you push through after Emmanuel was taken from you um, Is that how long were you in prison after having given birth? I was in prison after giving birth for 11 months. Wow. So I was released October the 6th of this year. He was born November the 12th. So I came home wow. on my daughter's 11th birthday. Her birthday is October the 6th. And wow. then I was able to spend his birthday with him. His birthday was November the 6th. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, November the 12th. <laughs> uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So how did you withstand those 11 months? Oh my gosh, I was angry. Mm. I think that Who I had- were you angry a, with? I was angry with myself. I was angry with my, it was everybody's fault. It was my <laughs> fault. It was the state of Georgia's fault. It was my parents' fault. It was Whitney's fault sometimes because I was mm. jealous. So I had to deal now with Now tell us some, who Whitney is. Okay, so Whitney is the caregiver of Emmanuel. Okay. Um, she, welcomed Emmanuel into her home mm. um, at three days old and has loved him ever since. And you did not know Whitney prior? I didn't know Whitney from a can of paint. I did not know her address. Mm -hmm. um, I really had to just like trust God, seriously, because she could have been anybody. And, um, you know, a couple of families were presented to me. Okay. And I didn't get a feeling of... Um, like, you know, like just that comfort, that relief, that confirmation that you need. Yeah. Um, and I, I contribute that to my spirit of discernment. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like my intuition is on point mm -hmm. and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Um, because this story could have turned out very different. Right. But um, when I say she has done everything that she said she was going to do mm -hmm. and beyond, and she never makes me feel like less than, like mm -hmm. I'm Emmanuel's mother, and she never oversteps those boundaries. Um, and so I'm very thankful for this situation, um, absolutely. If this had to happen, 
I'm happy that it happened this way. Mm -hmm. What was it like reuniting with your daughter oh my and your gosh. son after that 11 months? So I was released on my daughter's birthday. Mm -hmm. So that was just like, oh my gosh, it was like euphoria. And by that time you had been gone from your daughter mm -hmm. almost two years. Almost two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even longer than from Emmanuel. Right. Um, it was euphoria, like I can't even put that feeling into words. Like it was just like, I just wanted to hold my baby. Can you tell me about bonding with your children and how you built that bond once you were mm -hmm. out? And what about their presence and your time together feels like paradise to you? Okay, so my daughter loves to cook Okay. and I love to cook. So we get in the kitchen together, we cook. Um, my son is like crawling around on the floor. Well, he walks now. <laughs> Oh God! She said everything, <laughs> everything. <laughs> but um, he got his pots and pans, and me and my daughter's in the kitchen cooking, and I love that. And she's such an amazing cook, and oh, um, wow. she's like very, very creative. Like she's not the typical eleven-year-old. Like she likes to sew, and I'm like, who yeah. is this child? She <laughs> she's got a, a craftswoman. She she's very creative. She's a Libra, so she's oh yeah, very very creative. Um, and she's so much more than what I was at that age. Mm -hmm. So I find myself like um, sometimes trying to tamper and I have mm -hmm. to pull myself back and say, no, let her be who she is. Yeah. Like whoever she is, let her be as big as she wants to be. She has such a huge personality. And so um, I have to like tell myself like, no. If that's what she said it is, then that's what it is. And that's what she wants to do, and that's what she's going to do. She's her own person. She has big, grand ideas and plans. Good. And so, yes. She's not afraid to fall. She is fearless. Good. Fearless. Yeah. So, I love that for her, though. How does she and your son change your mindset about who you are? Oh, my And gosh. your per possibilities and your inner <laughs> power? Um, my daughter thinks that I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. And she thinks that I'm like the best mom in the world. So even when I don't feel that for myself, um, she definitely helps me feel that. Like, um, she inspires me to be a better person. And um, I just wanna do great things for them. Yeah. And my prayer is that my son never knows my absence. Um, he's been without me, but he'll have no memory of this. And um, although my daughter will have memory of this, um, it'll never happen again. Mm -hmm. I'll never be away from them again. Yeah. And she still looks at you like you're that perfect mother. Not perfect. <laughs> no, not perfect, but amazing. Amazing. Yes. And she tells me all the time, she's like, Mommy, you're beautiful. And mm. you have such good fashion sense. <laughs> And you're cool. And I'm like, wow, like you think all of this about me? And it's just, it's amazing how your children can edify you mm. and can validate you. Mm. And she does that for me. Have you started to believe her? Um, <laughs> I think some days. Yeah. Some days, yeah. But hey, it's nice to have somebody outside of you. Right. Affirming you. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, switching gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. When we talk about like the prison system and yes. formerly incarcerated people, yes. um, there's a lot of judgments and opinions mm -hmm. about what that means, especially for people who have not experienced that. Mm -hmm. uh, how do the opinions or judgments about you and your past um, from other people, how do those influence your life, your day-to-day -day mm. life? Well, it influenced my day-to-day -day life grandly because of the laws that are in place, unfortunately. Um, on a personal level, I know who I am and um, I know my heart, so it does not influence how I feel about myself, mm. um, but it does influence my life because um, people's opinions and their politics have created an environment that I can't thrive in unfortunately, so. Um, Can you say a little bit more about why you're not able to thrive? Well, because of the lack of employment opportunities to formerly incarcerated people in Georgia, um, the fact that every application, every rental application asks for a background check, mm -hmm. um, 
they want to know if you have any type of background and what it is and then you get disqualified from living in a place doesn't matter if you can afford it or not um, so those types of things really um, weigh on me I can't even find a place to live or a job to take care of my family um, because of people's opinions not facts but opinions um, right. so and you've served your time and I've served my time and um, and I'm on parole and I haven't violated and I'm trying to do the best I can do but part of my parole stipulations is that I'm employed so it's uh, I'm in a between a rock and a hard place yeah so how would you like to uh, to transform people's perspectives on formerly incarcerated people and the prison yeah. system? Um, I want them to know that we're human. And I think that we've been dehumanized. And I think that we need to like find the humanity in um, this particular demographic because I think they say like one in four person has been incarcerated. So that's wow. like huge, huge, which that's 25%, right? Yeah. So that's huge. Um, so it's not something that is rare or that is, it's, it's everyday people, humans that have served time and they should be able to live after they've served their time. Right. So. Um, I think that once people see us as humans, um, instead of just a number, or instead of just what they said that we did, or even if we did do it, um, we're still worth something. I think that we all have um, the capability to change. Um, I think that it's the desire to change. And I, I feel like the state has the burden to assist with that because if you incarcerated us if you locked us up and then you released us you granted us parole why not set us up for success right why not assist us with being successful instead of just saying do it on your own right. um, why would you even give someone a chance to be free if you're not going to set them up for success support them in that support them have jobs and housing yeah. because it's not a lot of incentive to live right and do right if you can't survive um, I think that for everybody a survival instinct kicks in and it's like okay I have to do whatever I have to do to make this work for me right is there anything I didn't ask uh, that you want to add um, about yourself, your life, your paradise, <laughs> or people's perspective? I just want people to know that they have power inside of them and that um, it's going to be okay. And I know it's like people are probably like, you're like, oh, that's your answer. Everything is going to be okay. But it will be okay because there's only, it can only be okay or not okay. And... <laughs> It's going to be okay. I really believe you that. You just got to choose it. Yes, you have to choose. I believe you choose your own destiny. And yes, things happen in your life um, that can maybe create a detour. Mm. But ultimately, you choose happiness. You choose mm. for everything to be okay. And especially when we have power inside of us. Mm. And we create our own paradise. It doesn't yeah. matter what you're going through. Yeah. You know, Um joy it is inside of me are, it doesn't even. matter where I am prison. I was in prison yeah. and I had joy in my heart so um, wow I love that I have that type of resilience right. and that type of strength and I think we all have that we just have to tap into it right right sometimes it takes being low to really tap into it sometimes and know it's you, within you you have to be low yeah Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for having a conversation with me. Absolutely. I appreciate you.